This episode of Science Scout takes it to the next level. On today's episode of Science Scout, we will be looking at something very exciting. But before we begin, be sure to subscribe to the channel by clicking the button below and also hit the bell so you can be the first to be notified about our new episodes. Today, we are going to talk about a topic that falls outside of general knowledge, liquid air battery, or CES. In order to maintain the efficient flow of power, utility operators must attempt to steady the supply and demand consistently in order to meet peak demand. Energy storage has become a hot topic in the industry in the last couple of years. But what is it all about? To understand, let's start with this question. Why do we need huge energy storage? Energy storage plays a critical role during this Equalization Act, and it helps to make an additional versatile and reliable grid system. In order to maintain the efficient flow of power, utility operators must attempt to steady the supply and demand consistently in order to meet peak demand, like in the winter, when resistive heaters are high in use, or in summer, when we all have our air conditioning cranked up, we look toward energy storage to accommodate these peaks. Energy storage can save the utilities and their customers money by eliminating the need for expanding new transmission lines and infrastructure. By nature, energy storage is able to provide backup power when grid power is lost, and we can store energy that is produced and not used, such as wind energy at night, and release the stored energy during the day when the demand is higher, and also the cost. The importance of associate degreed attractiveness of energy storage as an integral part of the electrical offer, transmission, and distribution system square measure are receiving increasing attention from a large variety of stakeholders, together with utilities, end users, grid system operators, and regulators. Energy storage is of interest to the utility. As a result, they'll store energy created by their plants that is not used, such as wind energy at night and unharness the stored energy throughout the day, once the demand is higher, and the cost as well. Despite all the challenges that the market faces, nothing seems to stand in the way of its explosive growth. The residential energy storage market size is projected to reach $1 billion by 2022 and $1.391 billion by 2027, up from $6,716.5 million in 2020, at a CAGR of 12.9% during the forecast period of 2022 to 2027. In addition, the U.S. total energy market crossed the billion threshold, around 1.691 in 2020. The market value is set to triple in 2021, rising more than $4 billion annually. Its growth through 2025 will push the market over the $7 billion mark annually. Between 2003 and 2018, 922 megawatts of large-scale battery storage power capacity across 134 systems was installed in the United States, three-quarters of which were installed between 2015 and 2018. This high demand for energy storage creates market booms with more growth to come. Let's have a quick look at the biggest projects in progress. One of the largest operational battery storage systems, the Hornsdale Power Reserve in the Australian state, options batteries created by Tesla using power packs. That project at the start had a capacity of 129 megawatt hours and could deliver 100 megawatts of power. It has since been expanded and is currently rated at 150 megawatts or 193.5 megawatt hours. However, a battery energy storage project in California is set to be the world's largest in terms of generation capacity. McCarthy Building Company's Renewable Energy and Storage Group recently completed construction of LS Power's 250-megawatt gateway project in San Diego County in early September 2020. Gateway energy storage started at 230 megawatts and upgraded to reach 250 megawatts, according to McCarthy. The project was launched and connected to SISO's grid in June, with an initial 62.5 megawatts of storage. LS Power said the project reached 200 megawatts of capacity on August 1st, with an additional 30 megawatts added on August 17th. But my last project falls outside the term of lithium battery and closer to thin air. 
The Highview Power Project in Greater Manchester, United Kingdom, may be a long-duration energy storage pioneer specializing in refrigerant energy storage. It received permission for a commercial-scale 50-megawatt or 250-megawatt-hour plan to store enough power to generate electricity for 100,000 homes in the European nation, building upon its earlier 5-power unit and 350-power unit pilot plants. It plans to develop 50 megawatts or 400 megawatt-hours. Highview Power relies on liquid air storage, or LEAS, or cryogenic energy storage, or CES. The concept of using liquid air as an energy storage was published in academic papers in the 1970s by Smith. The system relies on separating CO2 and vapor from the air to supply the next concentration of the chemical element. This chemical element will then be liquefied for storage and expanded back to gas after creating electricity. Highview Power announced that it is developing seven new liquid air projects in Spain, totaling 350 megawatt hours or 2.1 gigawatt hours, at a cost of about a billion dollars, taking its global project pipeline to more than 5 gigawatt hours. Highview defined the project pipeline as facilities that will be built in places such as the UK, US, and Chile. According to Highview Chief Executive Javier Cavada to Recharge in March, quote, that eight liquid air projects will enter the execution phase in 2021 or 2022, in addition to the 50 megawatt or 250 megawatt hours project under construction in Manchester, England. Its first U.S. facility will be a 50 megawatt or 400 megawatt hour plant in Vermont. Javier also announced that they are funding an additional $65 million for his project in Latin America, Chile, and Australia. But how exactly does the fractional distillation of liquid air work? The process depends on exploitation of liquefied air, which is called the charging system, or stage one. The liquefaction unit operates at off-peak times to store excessive electricity. Dry air and return gas are mixed and compressed to an elevated pressure by a two-stage compressor with intercoating by recuperative heat transfer device. Afterwards, high-pressure air is cooled down to sub-zero temperatures around negative 196 degrees Celsius, followed by an isentropic throttling process until the air liquefies. That liquid looks and acts quite a lot like liquid and nitrogen because that's what air is mostly made of. The 700 liters of ambient air is transformed into just one liter of liquid air. The fluid can be stored stage two in well-insulated, thin-walled steel vessels for many months in low pressure with losses as low as 0.05% by volume per day, and it can be safely stored above ground. This equipment is already globally deployed for bulk storage of liquid nitrogen, oxygen, and LNG. The tanks used within the industry have the potential to hold gigawatt hours of stored energy, and the waste heat released by the compression phase is stored in the so-called high-grade warm storage, or HGWS, in order to make the waste heat available for the discharge phase for later use. At times of peak demand, the cryogenic energy is extracted by a direct expansion cycle to reproduce electricity called power recovery, or stage 3. In this process, liquid air is pumped to a higher pressure level, about 15 times atmospheric pressure, releasing its cold energy to the cold storage media and processed via a heat exchange. The surrounding ambient air temperature makes the liquid boil and turn back into gas. The high-pressure and high-temperature gaseous air is then reheated in a four-stage expansion process to achieve a quasi-isothermal expansion. The flue gas of the expander can be passed across the turbine to drive a synchronous generator and put electricity back onto the grid. To optimize efficiency, the system also captures the cold energy released during the regasification process. This energy is stored in a high-grade cold storage, or HGCS, in order to make the waste cold available for the charge phase to do quite a lot of the cooling. So all of the energy storage components are basically just a volume of tankage. Now that we have some background about how it works, what is interesting about its performance? In general, LAES performs better at larger scales, turbo machinery is more efficient, and the standing losses, or the thermal leakage, from the storage tanks are lower. 
The key indicators for storage system performance usually relate to energy density, AC to AC round trip efficiency, flexibility and response time, and standing losses. Energy density is the amount of liquid air in kilograms required to deliver one megawatt hour of electricity back to the grid after losses. The system aims to achieve 10,000 kilograms or 10 tons per megawatt hour. However, they can currently deliver up to 7,000 kilograms per megawatt hour with high reheat temperature up to 400 Celsius. The system can achieve an efficiency of 50 to 60 percent if the cold thermal energy released during the power recovery process can be efficiently captured and reused in the liquefaction process. However, efficiencies above 70% can be achieved with the right combination of waste, cold, and heat. In addition, the response time for starting the power turbine to synchronization is usually achievable in around one minute when the cryogenic feed pumps are kept cold and the turbine oil warm. On the charging side, provided the liquefier is cold, starting takes less than 20 minutes. The last key indicator is standing losses, where a liquid air system loses its stored energy through heat leakage into the main cryogenic storage tank, which causes boil-off. They aim to cut the losses of less than 0.2% per day. Let's examine a comparison of CES with other major large-scale energy storage technologies. Currently, only pumped hydro storage, PHS, and compressed air energy storage, CAES, are developed technologies that are commercially available, though the actual applications, especially for large-scale utility, are still not widespread. CES, together with flow batteries and hydrogen storage, is still under development. The CES technology has a clear advantage of much higher volumetric and mass energy storage densities. CES are an order of magnitude lower, at 120 to 200 energy density, Pumped hydro storage has the lowest energy density of 0.5 to 1.5, whereas compressed air energy storage has 2 to 6. Response time is another key parameter for dynamic services. It indicates how quickly the storage device can discharge or charge when needs arise. The CES technology has a storage duration of hours to months and a response time of a few minutes, similar to the CAES and PHS technologies. All decoupled energy storage technologies offer a long discharge time, in hours. However, CES offers the shortest time, at 1 to 8 hours, compared to 1 to 24 plus hours, on PHS and CAES. However, in terms of power rate, PHS has the highest rate of 100 to 5,000 megawatts. Pumped hydro storage has a very high round-trip efficiencies of 70 to 85%. The round-trip efficiencies of CAES are 68 to 79 percent. Efficiencies can be lower due to the rapid compression and thermal energy conservation processes being more energy-consuming. On the other hand, a disadvantage of CES technology lies in its relatively low efficiency, up to 60 percent using today's technology. That's if the system is standalone. However, it should be noted that the round-trip efficiency of the CES system can be significantly enhanced if waste heat is available. But are liquid batteries worth it if we compare it to a traditional lithium battery? So let's say you start to push 60% or 70% clean energy targets. This introduces a huge need for storage, and there are currently limited long-duration storage options. A recent study out of New York compared short-duration storage, lithium battery, and long-duration storage, liquid air battery, in reducing curtailment of renewables by developing a mixed energy storage portfolio in each of the 11 zones in New York. They found that lithium-ion has 85% RTE at a $181 kilowatt-hour marginal cost of installed energy capacity. However, cryogenic energy storage has a 60% RTE at a $50 to kilowatt hour marginal cost. Based on 2025 renewable forecasts from NYISO and state procurements, real wind and solar profiles are generated without storage of 14 terawatt hours of renewable energy. It's curtailed either for lack of load or due to interzonal transmission constraints. The model is now constrained to reduce curtailment by deploying storage, lowest cost storage portfolio, in each of the 11 zones.
The model predicts that one terawatt hour of curtailment can be avoided, for example, if we focus on Zone K, Long Island. To shift curtailed energy to the large daily peaks, at least six hours of duration discharge is optimal. At the same time, the short duration technology is effective at shifting energy into the smaller peaks and helping with the lower peaks when necessary. Despite a lower round trip efficiency, long duration technology allows large peaks to be serviced cost effectively. The low marginal energy cost is clearly advantageous. In addition, the model predicts that up to 2 gigawatts of dispatchable storage can be deployed to avoid 1.4 terawatt hours of curtailment annually for the same cost. Finally, Hiveview's LAES represents a large scale energy storage system. The overall performance and cost levels are expected to be broadly comparable to those available from pumped hydro and compressed air systems, with the added benefit of the ability to site systems where they are required. It's been an interesting ride today learning about liquid air batteries, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Let us know your thoughts concerning this unique type of battery in the comments section below. Are you interested in learning about neuromorphic computing? Watch the next video. Don't forget to subscribe and tap the notification bell so that you are to be first notified of our new episodes. Thanks for watching it. Until our next episode, never stop learning.